Hey, what's up, Rev? What's up, what's up? It is so good to be with you guys tonight because tonight is our last night before we break for the summer. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm kind of in my feelings about it a little bit because this has been an absolutely incredible year. So many of you have reached out to me to tell me all the awesome things that God has done in your life this year. And some of you have actually slid into my DMs, which it's made me, I mean, it makes me feel very... Very cool, okay? Much more cool and relevant than I actually am. So thank you for that. But listen, whether this is your very first night with us or you have been coming every single week, I am so, so glad that you are here tonight because I believe that God has something to say to you tonight. And tonight we're also closing out our series called Meaning. And in this series, we have been spending some time talking about how to find meaning, and also how to live out a meaningful life. And tonight we're closing it all out by talking about Jesus. Now listen, the reason we're talking about Jesus is not because we are in church and we have to. The reason we are talking about Jesus tonight is because I believe that there is no better way to find a meaningful life than by following Jesus. There is no better way to find a meaningful life than by following Jesus. I absolutely believe that to be true. And my whole goal of the message tonight is to introduce you or maybe to reintroduce you to Jesus so that you can see him for who he really is and say, you know what? What he has to offer, I want. Where where Jesus is going, I'm going to. So tonight is, is what I hope to be a reintroduction to who Jesus really is. Because I believe that there is no better way to find, a me- to find meaning in your life than by following Jesus. And there are a lot of reasons why I believe that to be true. And we can't focus on all of them, so we're just going to focus on one tonight. And the one we're going to focus on is this. Jesus offers eternal life. Jesus offers eternal life. Now, while I believe this to be absolutely true, I also have a little bit of I have some problems with it because, well, I have a problem with quick fixes, which is that I love them. I love quick fixes. I love them because I don't like when my life isn't in order. I don't like when things aren't working or things are out of place. And so what I want to do is I want to take the fastest, easiest route to things working as I possibly can. And I have a lot of quick fixes that are kind of in my back pocket, but one of my very favorites is just ignoring a problem and pretending it doesn't exist. Does anyone else do that? Oh, it works so well, except that it doesn't. But what happens is I will have a problem and I will just overlook it because if I don't see it, if it's not in front of my face, then I don't have to fix anything. Problem solved. But sometimes this is an issue and it causes pain literally in my life. For a long time, I had these really bad headaches. Like as a kid, all the way up until college, I had these super bad headaches. And you know what I did? Nothing. I told no one about it. I didn't talk to a doctor. I didn't talk to my mom. I just like would either, I would go for a temporary solution where I would take like medicine or take a nap or just like try to get till bedtime so I could get rid of these headaches. And it wasn't until I got to college where my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, Kelsey, said, hey, idiot, don't do that anymore. Go to a doctor. Like go get your head checked or your eyes checked or something. Do something about it. So I go to a doctor, I go to an eye doctor, and they're like, man, your eyes are super messed up. Here's a prescription. I went and got glasses, and instantly my headaches went away. In fact, the only time that I get those headaches anymore is when I'm not wearing my permanent eyesight solution known as my glasses. Like, yo, if I'm not wearing my glasses, guaranteed I have got a headache. But see, my problem was that I wanted a quick fix, I wanted something temporary, but what I needed was something permanent. And I run into that dilemma often in my life. I walk into difficult seasons in in my relationships or my friendships. I walk into difficult seasons in, in my work. I walk into difficult seasons in my health, and I will be looking for a way out. I will be looking for a quick fix. I will be wanting to ignore the problem. I will try my best to move past it or get beyond it so that I can get back to living my life the way that I always had. But what I really need is something permanent, something bigger than my problems and something bigger than me. What I'm really longing for is something eternal. 
See, many of you have all kinds of different challenges and difficulties in your life. Challenges with friends, challenges with family, challenges with your faith, challenges that deal with your sense of meaning and your sense of purpose. And what I'm telling you is that all of those difficulties are signals to you that you are longing for something eternal. You are looking for a solution that lasts and lasts and lasts. But often what we will opt for are quick fixes and easy way outs. Because quick fixes will get us to tomorrow. But what we need is a way that will lead to eternal life. And there's a great story in the book of John uh, that kind of shows how Jesus responds when we want something temporary, but we need something permanent. But you kind of need to know the backstory in order to really understand what's going on here. So the backstory is this. <clears throat> in Jesus' day, there, there, were, there were the Jews, probably heard of the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And there were the Samaritans. And the Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They did not like each other at all. And it's really complicated why they didn't like each other. But what you need to know is that they both worshiped the same God. But they had a conflict that made them literally draw a line in the sand. They split up their region. So the Samaritans were over here and the Jews were over here. And they never mixed. They worshiped God in two different locations. But people would, people would go out of their way, miles out of their way. So they wouldn't even step foot into the, the nation's land. That's how bad it was. And that's kind of the context for this story. And the story starts with Jesus running for his life from a group of guys known as Pharisees. And these were the religious leaders of the day because they wanted to kill him. And they wanted to kill Jesus because Jesus was doing all kinds of miracles. He was talking about God and he was healing people. And he was kind of saying that like he was God. And the Pharisees were like, you shouldn't do that. We're going to kill you if you don't. So Jesus was like, sweet, I'm out. And he left. So he leaves his town and he's headed toward Galilee, this town called Galilee. But the road that takes him to Galilee goes straight through Samaria, which is where the Samaritans live. And so Jesus is in a place where he doesn't belong and he's tired because the journey is mostly by foot. It's in the desert. And so he's thirsty and he's tired. And so he finds a well. He sends his disciples off to go get some food for the day. And he sits down on this well because he doesn't have... He doesn't have a bucket. He doesn't have a rope. So he's waiting for someone to come to him so he can ask for a drink. And a woman comes his way. And so he asks her, excuse me, can I, can I have a drink? And this woman immediately notices that Jesus is a Jew. She knows him to be a Jew. And so she has no time for Jesus whatsoever. This is how she responds to Jesus. She's like, uh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now listen, what I'm about to say, I have no biblical background for this. But for whatever reason, whenever I read this in the Bible, I hear Cardi B's voice in my head talking to Jesus. I don't know why, but every time I read this sentence, I, the first thing I hear is, oh, I hear that phrase before she starts talking. She's just got an attitude about her that she's like, I don't, I don't care about you. I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Leave me alone. Jesus. But Jesus is unfazed by this because he obviously cares for this woman. And what he, wants, what he wants to explain to her is that he's not just there to trick her. He's not just there to take something from her. He is there actually to give her something. And so this is what he says. Jesus says, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Now, I think Jesus is trying to empathize with her here, but this is a super weird response. Like, I imagine this woman being like, living what? Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? But essentially what I think he's trying to do is trying to break down the barrier because there was a divide between this woman and Jesus. And he was trying to say to her, listen, I, I understand that your people and my people, we've got beef and we don't want to talk to each other, but I'm different. What I'm saying is I'm not here to trick you. I'm not here to take something from you. I have something to offer you. If you only knew what I could give to you, you would ask me for water and I would give you a kind that doesn't die. But this woman just doesn't, she totally misses the point. She doesn't get it at all. 
Because she looks around and she's like, yo, Jesus, you don't have a bucket. You don't have a rope. Like, you don't have anything. You don't have what it takes to give me water, Jesus. So what are you going to do about that? Jesus that is unfazed by, by that response because once again, he's there to help this woman see something that she didn't even know she was looking for. He had shown up in a place that he didn't belong so that he could offer this woman something eternal when she was looking for something temporary. And so this is what Jesus says. He tries to reason with her first. He says, anyone who drinks this water, he's talking about the water in the well, will soon be thirsty again, right? And we're all like, yeah, that makes sense. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So Jesus turns a corner here. He is no longer talking about H2O. Okay? He is talking about something much bigger than a drink of water. He is saying, what I could get from you, I would instantly be thirsty again. But what you can get from me will never ever end. But the woman still misses the point. She doesn't get it. And so what she says is, she, she says, well, sir, give me this water. Just give it to me. So I won't ever be thirsty again. I won't ever have to come back to this well again. Her basic response is, oh, Jesus, wouldn't that be great? That's a great idea. It's an adorable idea, Jesus. Give me this water because then I don't have to bring my bucket or my rope or come to this well and talk to weird people like you, talk about living water and eternal life and stuff. Just give me this water. But her mind is still so fixed on the temporary solution. And Jesus is trying to offer something different and eternal. And so Jesus has to make his point now. And so he, he gets even more serious. He gets even more personal. And so he says to this woman, listen, I'm not, I'm not here to give you a life hack, okay? So why don't you go, go home, grab your husband, come back here, and we'll talk about it. And I imagine at that point, the woman loses eye contact with Jesus. And she looks down at the ground. And her stomach turns within her, and her heart begins to beat. Because in that moment, when Jesus said that, he saw beyond the skin on her body, and into her soul. Jesus knew something about this woman that she didn't think anybody else knew. Because she responds and says, uh, well, Jesus, I don't, have, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus makes his point. And he says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now just imagine for a moment that you're this woman. Imagine for a moment that you have got some things in your past that you are not very proud of. Imagine that you have some regrets. Imagine that you have made some mistakes in your life and, and that there are these moments where you're by yourself and in the dark and you close your eyes and it bubbles to the surface and all you feel is shame. And all you hope for is that no one ever finds out what you're dealing with. And then one day you go to a well that you've been to hundreds of times to get water like you have hundreds of times. And you meet this guy who's talking to you about living water and eternal life. And then suddenly he knows your heart. Suddenly he sees past your frustration. Suddenly, he, he crosses the barrier of your separation because he's a Jew and you're a Samaritan. And all of a sudden, you two are connected. How would you respond? Well, I imagine this woman is shocked. I imagine she is beside herself, not knowing what to do next. And most of all, she probably just doesn't want to talk about it. Which is why she responds by saying this. She's like, oh, well, oh, you must be a prophet, Jesus. Like, you must be able to tell the future, Jesus. So, so please tell me, why is it that the Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? Now, if this question seems like out of left field, it's because it is. 
She's trying to say, Jesus, I don't want to talk about this with you. You must be some religious guy. You must be some prophet or preacher guy. So, so here's this theological question. We're separated because we have to worship in two separate locations. So why is that, Jesus? Let's talk about that, Jesus. Anything other than my five husbands, Jesus? But Jesus meets her where she's at. He answers her question. And he begins by, by explaining that, you know what, you're right. There was a time where we were separated when we worshiped. There was a time it really mattered where you lived and what your name was in order to worship God. But then Jesus said, something different is happening now. Something new is happening now. And he goes on to say this. The time is coming. In fact, it is here now when what you are called will not matter. And where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. And then Jesus goes on to say, your worship must engage your spirit in, in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people God is looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. See, Jesus takes her question. She, she take, he takes her avoidance and he says, you know what, you're right. We are in two separate locations, but I'm here now and things are different. Because listen, it, it, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you live. What matters most is if you are willing if you are courageous enough to come before God with all of your brokenness and with all of your success and say, God, here I am, then in return, you don't get shame for your name. You don't get shame for where you live. You don't get tossed aside because you're a Samaritan and I'm a Jew. You get eternal life. All God wants is all that you are. See, Jesus wasn't there to shame her. He wasn't there to put this woman down. He was there to offer her a cup of water that would constantly leave her satisfied. He was there to show her a new way forward. But this woman is still a little skeptical. And so she kind of continues down this religious route. And she says, well, Jesus, um, me as a Samaritan, me and my people, we believe uh, that someone's going to come that's our Messiah. Someone's going to come who, who is our Savior, and he's going, to, he's going to be sent from God, and he's going to know all the promises of God, and he's going to be, be able to lead us and explain everything to us. And so once he shows up, Jesus, once he comes, and if he's saying the same things that you're saying, then like maybe, maybe I'll believe it. And then I imagine Jesus saying, hey, could you just come a little bit closer? Like, I have something I want to tell you, but I don't want everyone to hear. I just, I just want this to be for you. And she comes a little bit closer. And Jesus whispers to her, it's me. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. It's me. Jesus is saying to her, and I think to every one of you, the wait is over. So the future is here now, and eternal life is not something that you have to hope for once you die. No. Eternal life is a gift given to you now in this present moment. And Jesus is saying to her, and I'm offering it to you. I am your eternal solution. Jesus says, I know your heart I know your past, 
I know your name. I know your nationality. I know everything about you, and I love you anyway. And friends, the reason I tell you that story tonight about that Samaritan woman is so that hopefully you can see that you and I are that Samaritan woman. You see, all of us have something that separate us from God. All of us have this, have this distance and this disconnection from God. All of us have a past. All of us have things in our past that we're not very proud of. All of us have regrets. All of us knew the right thing to do and we didn't do it when it counted. All of us have made mistakes. All of us at one time or another have preferred the easy way out or a quick fix over something permanent and eternal. But Jesus is not here to offer us quick fixes. He is here to offer us eternity. He is offering a future with him where we can show up before God in our brokenness, in our joy, in our pain, in our gratitude, and give ourselves completely over to him and not be met with shame, but be, but be met with eternal life. And then, and then God sets our difficulties and our problems up against eternity. So that when we're going through challenges, when we are in difficult seasons, we are able to know and remember that they won't last that long. Because we are in an eternal relationship with God and he will see us through. Jesus is offering all of us tonight the chance to have a meaningful future by following Jesus and accepting his eternal life for us. And there is a reason, there is a reason he is able to offer you eternal life. And it's because 2,000 years ago, Jesus was murdered on a cross. Jesus was killed. And in that death, he took upon himself my sin. He took upon himself your mistakes. He took upon himself the brokenness of our world that is all around us. And in that process, he paved a way to God's grace and forgiveness so that all of us have access to God's love whenever we need it. But lots of people have died. The difference between all of those people and Jesus is that Jesus did not stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later to punctuate the reality that he is the one who can offer eternal life. He is the one, the only one, who can lead us into an eternal state of living life that is better than anything we have ever experienced before. So friends, my question to you tonight is, are you done with quick fixes? Are you ready to say, I'm ready to see I'm not, I'm not ready to just get rid of headaches or get rid of pain for a moment. I want to see. I want to live into a better future. I want to find meaning for my life. I want to know God. If that's you tonight, then my challenge for you, my encouragement to you, is to not, do not trade your life for something temporary. Trade your life to follow God and find meaning by following Jesus. So what I want to do tonight is I want to I extend the invitation to all of you across all of our campuses tonight. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what? I've been looking for temporary fixes for too long. But I know that what I'm looking for is something that will last. Or maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, Brenna, maybe I've heard this before. I know what it means to follow Jesus. But I need to be reintroduced to him. I need to know him again. I, I need to be reminded that his water doesn't ever run dry. Listen, what, wherever you are tonight, Jesus is at a well in your life. 
And he is offering you a cup that will never run dry. And so, friends, if you are ready to receive that, if you're ready to go before God and give yourself over to him completely, then I want to pray with you right now. And if you're here tonight and you want to offer yourself back to God, say, Jesus, remind me that your cup never runs dry. Then I want to pray for you right now. So if we could, at all campuses, if you could just close your eyes for a minute. And if you want to accept Jesus into your life, if you want to accept his gift of eternal life, then I want you to pray this prayer with me silently in your heart and in your mind. Let's pray together. Jesus, I need your life. My temporary fixes are not working. I know that I'm separated from you, but I am ready to commit myself to you completely. God, lead me into a future where I can follow you and find meaning for my life. Help me to trust you. Help me to believe in you. Help me to love you as you have loved me. We trust you and we love you, Jesus. Amen. So, hey, Rev, here's what we're going to do right now. At all of your campuses, the bands are going to come back onto the stage, and we're going to jump into a time of worship. And what I want for you in this moment is I want you to worship like Jesus talked about. To worship in such a way where you bring your full self, all of your brokenness, all of your victory, all of your pain, all of your gratitude, bring it to Jesus in this moment. Because I don't know about you, but I want eternal life. I, I want to be excited about what God has in store for me. I want to look into this next season and into this next summer and be ready for what God has for me. And I think we ready ourselves by worshiping him with our whole selves. So let's do that together right now. And then after worship, the pastors at your campuses are going to come back onto the stage and they're going to walk you through a card that if you said yes to Jesus for the first time tonight or if you said yes to Jesus at all this whole year, we want to know about it so we can support you and pray for you and come alongside of you. So be looking for that. But right now, stand with me at all campuses and let's sing out our worship to Jesus. Thanks, Rev.